This is whipped cream. Now the eggs. Okay, you're cracking your eggs. That's a special tool I have here. Just crack it a little bit and then it's got a top. And you save the top. It's very important as you're drying the top. You're cutting your egg. Take two eggs. With traditional sheared eggs, they are baked in cream. Here, they'll be scrambled. Season the eggs with salt and pepper. You add just a touch of butter for the smoothness, and you mix your eggs really, really well. The eggs will be scrambled in a small saucepan. The most important are beginning from cold to warm. And you stir this very, on very low temperature, very consistency, but a smooth consistency. No overheat the eggs until we go dry on the globally. When you do it, just put on a low heat. As the eggs begin to cook, the chef moves them on and off the flat top to control the temperature. I use a whip, it's much, much easier to do it. You can use, use a wooden spatula, but with a whip in general, it's a bit more easy to do for the smoothness. Stir consistently, go careful in the sides and the board, or so you not make it too dry. And remember, when you almost cook, they will cook a bit longer when you take it out for the, for the pan. Are you filling up your eggs? It's really important, go careful, nice and smooth, you can see it. Take a stainless spoon, no use silver, for your eggs. Next step, you're adding the cream. You go around in a circle. It's very important as you keep space in the middle, right in the middle, this is where we put the caviar. Same for the caviar. Buy the best what you can. Here I use beluga. Just use the best what you can find. No use some raw, some fish eggs. Use beluga when you can really afford some beluga, maggot meat, etc. But really what makes this dish is the caviar. There's nothing else. The caviar on the eggs, the freshness for the eggs, the farmer's eggs. Use a little garnish. Serve this. Here I serve this mini gold spoon. Voila. In 1992, a man sold his chain of drugstores and bought an antebellum house in Marietta, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. The property, now called the 1848 house, was carefully restored, including a mini ball hole in the wall. The chef at taping time was Tom McIern and cooks rabbit three ways. The chef removes the hind legs, which will later be stuffed. After you remove from the back, there's a, a little bridge bone that needs to be removed, so we're gonna go ahead and remove that. Separate it from the knuckle. And we're gonna reserve the bones for the rabbit stock. 
Okay, two hind legs. Here we have the four legs. This we're gonna use for the confit. This needs to uh, marinate for 24 hours, so we wanna go ahead and get that going first. The uh, two loins and the flank are on the top of the rabbit. The two loins run this way and the flank is out to the side. We're gonna cut the flank off. We're gonna use the flank for our sauce. Okay. The uh, tenderloins run along the bottom. As you can see, they're very, very small. We're just going to use that for uh, more trimmings for our sauce. The loins run along the back. It's easier to go ahead and remove the silver skin now while it's on the rabbit rather than try to remove it after. Okay, once the silver skin is removed, we're going to cut along the backbone. We're going to cut on each side run the knife, the point of the knife, starting at the front of the rabbit, run it along the, the rib bone. Then we're gonna use our fingers, spread it out a little bit, and just trim it off the rabbit. Eventually, the loin will be lightly smoked and sauteed. The marinade for the front legs consists of chopped ginger, chopped garlic, and some fresh herbs. The ginger is already in the bowl. some salt, black pepper, some fresh thyme, and rosemary. Mix that up real well. And of course, this is gonna marinate for 24 hours. The thigh bone of the back leg was removed and the meat is pounded prior to stuffing. We're gonna take our figs, cherries, golden raisins, and blueberries that are dried and that have soaked in Grand Marnier. And we're gonna spread it out along this way. covering the whole length of the thigh. And then we're just gonna roll it up. Okay, punching the end in. And we're gonna take a piece of butcher's twine, tying the end first so that you can hold the fruit in so it won't come out when you're sauteing. Cut off the excess string. Now we're ready to saute. The loins, what we're gonna do to the loins is we're gonna marinate the loins in uh, bourbon and teriyaki. One quarter cup bourbon, one quarter cup teriyaki. We're gonna marinate that with some fresh rosemary. While that's marinating, we're gonna get our smoker ready. The chef uses a stove top smoker. Okay. Smoker should be ready. Take the loins. The loins are only smoked for 30 seconds. We have to remember too that we're going to saute the loins, so we want to make sure that not too much heat is applied. Okay, then we're gonna take our loins, brush them with mustard, and set them aside. Now the chef sets up the confit for the front legs using rendered duck fat. It's important to have the uh, duck fat heated. Just enough fat to cover. We're gonna bring it to a boil. 
or a simmer. As soon as it comes to a simmer, we're going to put it in a 200 degree oven and cook it for about an hour, an hour and a half, uh, or just till it's tender. The stuffed back legs are dredged in flour and sauteed in olive oil. Okay, we're sauteing these in olive oil. Getting them nice and brown on the bottom side. After browning, the hind legs are finished in the oven. Finally, the loin is sauteed in hot olive oil. Once again, the loin is small, so we're going to saute it very fast. Here's a chef's tip. If the food catches fire, blow it out. You want to make sure that you don't overcook the rabbit, because rabbit is very, very nice when it's, when it's medium, medium rare. After that, it starts to get tough. The rabbit will be presented with wilted mustard greens and a basmati rice, crawfish, and diced pepper mixture. Now we're gonna slice our um, slice our loin for plate presentation. The fruit stuffed hind leg is also sliced. Okay, we're going to fan out our loin. We're going to stand this up. We're going to fan this out this way. We're going to put our comfy foreleg in the center. The sauce is rabbit stock, which was enriched with reduced veal stock. Now we want to sauce the dish. That's it. Keegan Gerhard was born in San Bernardino, California, lived in Germany, then attended the University of Mississippi. Now assistant pastry chef at the Ritz-Carlton Naples in Florida, he has been featured in Chef Magazine and Chocolatier. His dish is chocolate beignets with cappuccino milkshake. The beignets include chocolate ganache, hot cream, chopped chocolate, and butter, which is finished here with a stick blender. The finishing touch to this ganache before we pipe it into our molds is to add a little bit of candied hazelnut. And this is really just a taste, just a little bit of candied hazelnuts, ground up. Fold that in. Just till you see it, nice, nicely, evenly distributed. That's going to give a little texture to this dessert. Otherwise, when you're eating the beignet, although it's delicious, you just have a big, gooey uh, mass in your mouth. So this adds a little bit of dimension and texture and a little roastiness to it. The ganache goes into flexi-pan molds, then is frozen. Flour and cocoa, both sifted, begin the batter. This is the same idea of, of, a, of, a, of a dry cake batter or something that you might do to order. I'm going to put all your dry ingredients together, kind of mix them around, add our sugar, 
kind of get it evenly so that when we begin to add our liquids, it'll, it'll mix nicely. And you could do this on a machine. It's, it's, it, it doesn't respond particularly well this, to, to being over mixed. So you could do it in a, in a home machine with a paddle. Uh, I prefer by hand. I prefer by hand. Baking powder. Salt. Balance the sweetness and a little bit of cinnamon. Cinnamon really complements uh, Manjari chocolate quite nicely and uh, also believes, helps to bring out a little bit of the highlights of the hazelnut inside the ganache. So just a nice, nicely mixed dry ingredients. Just by the nature of whisking, you have a, a natural well on the inside and you can slowly begin to add your egg. It's gonna be quite tight in the beginning. And to add the chocolate. I mean the milk, I'm sorry. So we want this to be quite thick. Another advantage of having the batter thick is that when you're done, if you drop it into the fryer just so, as we'll show you later, you can have a nice tail, which is a really nice effect on the plate. Your batter, your fritter batter is finished. The beignets will be served with what the chef calls a cappuccino milkshake, coffee ice cream blended with milk. For the milkshake, I usually go about a third of the way up the ice cream. It's no real perfect recipe I found. But we're looking for something very thick. We're looking for something, we're looking for something that they can really use a spoon to eat. The beignet preparation starts by unmolding the frozen ganache. We're going to give them we're going to give them three beignets for an order. What we'll do is that when you take a chocolate product out of a refrigerator or a freezer, it really tends to build up a little bit of condensation initially. So sort of lightly dip it in flour, try and tap off the excess flour. That's that. We'll take the, beignet, the chocolate ganache, chocolate and hazelnut ganache that we made previously. And as you can see, the batter is quite thick, as we spoke about before. And it's important so that it stays on the ganache in the fryer, gives a little bit of insulation so that it doesn't completely melt in the fryer. And then when we fry it off, it'll also add a little, little element of texture. You want to gently dip the, the batter down into the oil and actually let it begin to fry on the spoon before you drop it off. We'll do this two more times. You want to let it fry for about three or four minutes. You can see our first beignet is finished. Each one is going to be different. And I think it's part of the uniqueness of the dessert. Transfer the warm beignets. kind of do it in a little, you can see the ganache is nice and warm, it's oozing out everywhere. It's going to be a luscious dessert, but we want to serve it in a new container so that it's nice and clean for the guests. Give them a little extra chocolate sauce on top, as if they needed more chocolate. You can pour straight from the blender. See it's nice and thick so they can eat it with a spoon. The milkshake is topped with whipped cream and cinnamon. And then to top it all off to make sure that uh, the guest is completely satisfied. We'll give them a little frozen Baileys on the side. And the waiters take it out to the room. They can present the beignet and present the milkshake and give them a little floater of Baileys on the top. And there you have it, chocolate beignets with the cappuccino milkshake. Thank you.
Welcome to Great Chefs, a culinary tour of the United States, featuring some of the country's finest chefs. The appetizer is prepared by Vince Tyler at Carlucci in Rosemont, a suburb of Chicago. It's a hefty portobello mushroom salad with a warm pancetta dressing. Then from St. Michael's, Maryland, Vincent Van Heck presents an entree from the inn at Perry Cabin, roasted red snapper with garlic, lemon, and parsley sauce. Dessert is served by Lisa Liggett in New Orleans. It's her version of the classic blancmange, an almond-flavored cooked pudding. She uses yogurt and presents edible flowers. Carlucci is a very busy Italian restaurant near the even busier O'Hare Field in Chicago. The executive chef, Vince Tyler, had good credentials, having worked at the highly touted Spiaggia, then traveling to Italy for a year of work in various operations. His dish is a portobello salad. Okay, for the warm uh, pancetta and shallot dressing, we're going to take our sliced pancetta. Pancetta is um, a rolled and cured Italian bacon. Unlike uh, the American bacon, it's not smoked. We're just gonna slice it thin. It can be purchased at most Italian grocery stores. It's best to have them slice it thin on the slicer there, making your work a little bit easier. All you have to do then is stack it up and slice it thin. We're gonna saute this off until it just starts to brown. Evening it out in a pan on a medium flame. In the meantime, we'll slice our shallots. Slicing them in half first will make it easier to keep them flat. And then we'll just slice them nice and thin. Lengthwise. When we saute off the pancetta, we're going to want to let it sit and not really move the pan around that much. The idea is that the more you move the pan around and take it on and off the fire, it'll cool off too much. We're also going to slice our, shell, our chives up. The chives will go in at the very end of the dish. We'll gently slice these up real thin, trying not to push down on them a lot, which flattens them out. Just as parts of the pancetta start to brown, you can see here, that's when we'll add in our shallots. If we wait too long, the pancetta will burn and get too crispy by the time the shallots are soft. So add our shallots and mix that in. By the time the shallots are soft, the pancetta should be almost a golden brown. At this point, the onions are nice and brown. The pancetta is brown and crisp. We're going to add into it, while it's still on the fire, our balsamic vinegar. Just let this warm up a little bit. We're going to take it off the fire and add in our olive oil and our chives.
And then we'll set this on the side until we use it later on the salad. To roast off our portobello mushrooms, we're first taking off the stem. We'll place two of the mushrooms capside down in our olive oil. We'll season them with salt and pepper. Chopped fresh rosemary and garlic. They go into a 375 degree oven. Now we're gonna roast these off in the oven for about 15 to 20 minutes until they're soft. The chef preps the salad. Taking our yellow tomato, and slicing just around the outside of it, about a quarter of an inch. And this will remove the meat of the tomato and hopefully not many of the seeds give us nice slices that we can julienne. A variety of mixed greens comprise the salad. We'll add in some of our yellow tomatoes. Taking a look at our mushrooms when they start to get a little dark brown on top and about halfway soft, we'll turn them over. We need about three or four more minutes. In the meantime, we'll dress our salad with our warm dressing. It should be just warm and not too hot. It's too hot, it'll wilt the lettuce too fast. I try not to put the dressing right on top of the lettuce, but I'll put it on the outside and then toss it in. This way I won't bruise the lettuce as much and it won't overly coat them. Generally what happens is after you dress the, the lettuce, all the tomatoes and pancetta fall to the bottom, so we want to make sure that we evenly distri distribute the tomatoes and pancetta on top. So we'll take one of our mushrooms out, let it drain from the oil. And we're going to slice the mushroom almost all the way through, being careful not to smash it down. Just leaving it attached by about a quarter of an inch at the top of the mushroom and slicing it in about quarter inch slices. A little bit of an angle instead of slicing straight through. We'll take a little bit of the oil and garlic and drizzle that over the top. Vincent van Heck was born in Belgium and raised in London. At the time of taping, he was executive chef at the Inn at Perry Cabin, a sprawling property on the Miles River at Maryland's eastern shore. He subsequently moved to Southern California. The entree is roasted red snapper with garlic sauce. The chef begins by trimming a large snapper filet that has been scaled. The skin was left on. I'm going to actually catch the cut this fillet into, into triangles uh, for a presentation purpose. You can serve the, uh, the fillet actually cut into uh, to portions down the fillet, um, but for, for presentation purposes I will actually cut the fillet into triangles.
Meanwhile, the chef cooks minced garlic, which will eventually become the base of the sauce. Put in all your garlic. Just make sure that the garlic is nicely coated with the olive oil. And we need to roast that in an oven around 375 degrees until it becomes a nutty, golden brown texture. The vegetable garnish, julienned on a mandolin, includes carrot. Zucchini, green part only. The outside of yellow squash. And using a knife, julienned leek. And julienned fennel. Now the chef takes a look at the garlic. See here that the garlic is starting to crispen up. Just going to give it a little bit of a stir and just cook it for a little bit longer until it's all completely golden brown. Take about one more minute. Meanwhile, sliced onion completes the vegetable prep. The garlic is drained on a paper towel. So just put this on a bit of kitchen towel just to absorb the uh, excess oil. Now the chef seasons the snapper fillets. On both sides. Now you can flour the snapper. Uh, I prefer not to. Um, I'm actually using a non-stick pan, uh, so I shouldn't have any problems. But if you, uh, if you do have a regular pan, perhaps it's a good idea just to flour it very, very lightly. Uh, it just, it just uh, makes sure that it doesn't stick. So in the non-stick pan, just a little bit of olive oil. Just basically wait till the, uh, the olive oil just, just starts to smoke. Then uh, you know you've uh, reached a good temperature. You can see just uh, it's starting to smoke there. Put the uh, red snapper skin side down to start off with. Just need to sear the skin off. Just flip it over. Just sear the other side off. Put it back on the skin side. And put it in the oven, preheated. 375, uh, for around about uh, four to five minutes. The vegetables are cooked in butter based on the cooking time for each. Just about there. And then start off with your, uh, the harder vegetables. The onion, the fennel, carrots, and the leek. And start to just to saute. You just basically need to uh, cook the vegetables to allow them to go soft. You don't, you don't really want any color. The zucchini and yellow squash will go in last. At this stage, on the, uh, on the snapper, as you can see, it's not quite cooked. I'd just like to add just a little bit of thyme, gives it a, just that little bit extra flavor. Now the chef continues with the sauce employing an interesting method. It's very important that with the butter, um, it does actually reach that hazelnut uh, stage uh, because it makes all the difference to the taste. We've almost reached that now, just a little bit longer.
This is a very fast source, very precise source also. So we're almost getting to noisette there. There we go, we're at noisette now. Throw in all your garlic. And just cook your garlic off just for a few seconds in there. Take your pan off the heat. Add some lemon juice. Bear in mind, you want to avoid burning the garlic and the butter. Nice lot of uh, fr freshly chopped parsley. Presentation begins with the vegetables. Red snapper just propped to the side. You can see how the skin is now quite nice and crispy. It's very pleasant to eat. And your garlic sauce, just a little bit over the fish. A little bit on the plate. A sprig of fennel leaves finishes the plate. Windsor Court Hotel in New Orleans features the pastry of Lisa Liggett. She trained at the French Culinary Institute in New York and also holds a BA in psychology. Always helpful, especially for a pastry chef. Her artistic dessert is blancmange. Today we're going to make a blancmange, which is a yogurt almond flan. We're going to start out with a plastic mold. We use edible flowers. <laughs> and we're going to take some white wine and we're going to heat it up with some simple syrup, which is sugar and water. And we're just going to warm that. And we have gelatin sheets, and you have to bloom the gelatin in water before you add it. Cold water, must be cold water, to soften the gelatin. Once the leaves have softened, they are squeezed dry and go directly into the wine simple syrup mixture. I'm going to add it in here. Just till it's melted. And then we're going to pour it on top of the flowers, about three tablespoons. Okay, and then you want to refrigerate this until it's set. The blancmange starts with 12 ounces of plain yogurt and six ounces of sugar. Gonna whisk in our sugar. We have to soften our gelatin again, one sheet at a time. This is almond extract. And you want to squeeze the water out. And we're going to microwave it. 
to bloom the gelatin. You can also bloom the gelatin over a hot water bath. And as you can see, the gelatin is ready. So we whisk that in. The softened gelatin melted in about 20 seconds on high. After incorporation, whipped cream is folded in. A little cream at first. And then the rest of the cream. Then the mixture goes into the molds. The white wine mixture has already set. Right, we're gonna refrigerate that till set. That's gonna be a few hours, best stuff overnight. After the flans have set, a round of sponge cake becomes the base. We're gonna set it on top of this. The domes are dipped in hot water to unmold and a passion fruit sauce accompanies the presentation. Passion fruit, pure, passion fruit puree that's been thickened slightly with cornstarch. We're going to garnish it with a few berries. Welcome to Great Chefs, a culinary tour of the United States, featuring some of the country's finest chefs. Takashi Yagahashi cooks an appetizer from Ambria in Chicago. It is seared cape scallops with set mushrooms, white asparagus, and an interesting reduced mushroom broth vinaigrette. Then from Nana's, Scott Howell's Durham, North Carolina restaurant, the chef owner presents sautéed filet of jolt head, a type of sea bream with tomato broth. Then Norman Love, corporate pastry chef of the Ritz-Carlton Hotels, offers a sky-high Kahlua souffle with chocolate sauce. Note his use of roasted coffee beans. Taping time, the chef at Ambria in Chicago was Takashi Yagahashi. He has since moved on, allegedly, to Detroit. He doesn't look old enough to work in all the kitchens he has. They include River Cafe in New York, Masa's in San Francisco, and Yoshi's in Chicago. 
Here are his seared scallops. Here's the uh, cape scallops, the very fresh from the uh, main scallops. They're very sweet, like the candies. Salt and pepper. We start in uh, sauteed mushrooms. It's the oil boil. Today we're going to use the uh, fresh sets. Just a little bit more. And check the green beans. The chef has started to poach green beans in salted water. Just a little bit more. Make sure that nice and golden brown. A little bit of salt on the peppers. Touch of a little bit of butter. The green beans are drained, then go into ice water to stop the cooking. Yep. The seps are turned. Like this. Then now we're going to put a little bit of shallots on the garlic. If we put in a shallots and the garlic in the first place, sometimes get burned. So we wanna do put the shallots and the garlic in the middle of the saute. Then a little bit of uh, Italian parsley. Then keep it side and warm. And now we're gonna saute the sea scallops. The pan need very, you know, uh, very high and very hot because we wanna we wanna sear that the uh, scallops. And then otherwise we don't lose any juice. Put the seed scallops. In the meantime, put back the uh, mushrooms. Then we're gonna add to the, uh, this is a white asparagus, already branched. Put a little bit. And and a little green beans. Okay, then toss together. Then scallops. Sea scallops, this is a tiny base scallop, so uh, saute them maybe just one minute. Okay, here is the uh, mushrooms. Uh, it's the regular mushrooms. We put in one quarter of water and uh, eight ounces of the uh, mushrooms. Then we deduce, we cook them like uh, maybe one hour, at a long time. And getting, we're gonna reduce it. Eventually, one quarter of the mushroom stock is reduced to about one cup. It's the base of a vinaigrette. Then we're going to add a little bit of a 
balsamic vinegar. Then here's a extra virgin olive oil. Then a little bit of salt and the peppers. Then mix it. Okay, this is the uh, mushroom vinegar. Mushroom and asparagus and uh, green beans. Center of the plates. Scallops. Put a little bit mushroom vinegar on the top. Then a little bit of a uh, shabu on the top. It's a very simple dish. the CIA, Scott Howell, a North Carolina native, interned for Jonathan Waxman and Paul Bartolotta. Then he traveled and worked in Italy before cooking at the famed Boulet in New York. Returning to North Carolina, he joined Ben Barker before opening Nana's. His entree is jolt head in broth. Okay, first off, this is a jolt head. This is a fish that's coming off the coast of North Carolina. Some people call it porgy too. We're real successful in the restaurant with it. It's not a very expensive fish for it, so we like it as far as making money. I'm gonna cut down around the gill plate. Start in. It's a fairly flat fish, but it's really clean. It's gonna saute up firm. Once I get it to this point, I'll just trim it a little bit. Trim the belly. Pull the pins. Pin bones are removed with needle nose pliers. The thing that's kind of key about it as far as this fish is, is we like to keep the skin on it. Making sure that all the scales are off. What we like to do is nip it right in the middle. Keeping it tight and just score the skin all the way down, all the way down here. What that does is it allows the, instead of the fish folding up like you see sometimes when it's sauteed, the fish will fillet soft. It'll be much more relaxed. And I think it's much more tender when it's like that, when it's sauteed. So I'm gonna leave it here. And we'll go to work the broth, the basil tomato broth with fresh chanterelles. So the first thing I wanna do is trim the chanterelles. It's a little bit big, so we'll make them about like that. I've already rubbed these off with a damp towel. And I like to keep them when they're small like that. Oh. These are the first of the season, so they're nice and small. Really tender. We 
find on the mushrooms, it's better to cook them on as high heat as you can. It sears in the juices of the, of the mushroom. These mushrooms are not very wet though. So you can go down a little bit on the heat. It depends on how much moisture is in the, in the mushroom. Once it gets to a certain point, I don't want to cook it all the way because I'm going to cook it in the broth as well. So once it gets to a certain point, I'm going to add a little bit of butter, some shallots to finish. And I don't really want to cook the shallots hard. I just want to cook them right at the end. Just for a minute, I'm going to turn the chanterelles on low and let them cook while we're setting the other broth. The broth begins by softening chopped leeks and shallots. Then mushrooms are added. Once the chanterelles are about to this point, we'll add them into here. Ultimately, all of these ingredients will go into the broth. Let it work on about a low to medium heat. You don't want to just kill it with heat. Then. I think it's the best to control it. We're going to put a little bit of fish stock in here. You don't want to have a whole lot. You want to have enough just to kind of just come to the top of the mushrooms. Once we're at a boil, we're going to add the tomatoes. These are local golden and red cherry, red pear tomatoes that I get from a guy right down the way. A touch of roasted garlic puree. More fish stock. A little bit of salt and pepper. It's not really a stew, but it is kind of a stew, so I'll set that on the back while we cook the fish. Both sides are seasoned with salt and pepper. It's wonder flour, a little, just a touch, not much. A little olive oil is in the pan. And since we've cut the skin, the fish stays flat, it doesn't bow up. Light brown. Once we get it over to this side, a little bit of herbs. Parsley, sage, and thyme. Touch of butter. Take the butter. Let it get the juices from the fish. Let it bake just a little bit, and then we'll finish it in the oven. 350 degrees for two to three minutes. The broth is finished with basil puree and basil oil. Just bring it off. Touch of basil oil. Fish right on top. I'll take a few of the chanterelles. Mm. 